The problem is that the Taliban ruled, but they did not govern. We don't have a Taliban policy as to what they want to do regarding humanitarian relief. Hello and welcome to G-Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer. And today, it's been three months since the US withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Taliban remains firmly in control. As the country faces a bitter winter, the United Nations says that nearly 23 million people will experience food insecurity by March. Can the Taliban stave off starvation for the people it now claims to govern? And is there anything the international community can do to prevent this countdown to catastrophe without emboldening a militant group known for its human rights abuses? I speak with renowned journalist and author Ahmed Rashid. He wrote the critically acclaimed book Taliban, Militant Islam, Oil, and Fundamentalism in Central Asia way back in the year 2000. And he says not a lot has changed with the group since. And then I welcome back to the show activist Pashtana Durrani, who was hiding from the Taliban in Afghanistan the last time we spoke. But first. On August 30, 2021, last U.S. military planes took off from Kabul marking the end to 20 years of war. They left the Taliban to regain total control of the country, a militant group that now claims to have reformed. Recently, the Taliban has tried to show their softer side to contrast with the barbaric scenes from last time they were in control from 1996 to 2001. Since August, members of the group have been spotted riding bumper cars at amusement parks, pedaling swan boats at national parks, and giggling on trampolines. What is it? But people, and by people I mean me, are skeptical that Taliban 2.0 is anything more than a PR stunt. And I expect more of the same human rights abuses and repression that the world witnessed decades ago. In the 1990s, women couldn't work or attend school in Afghanistan. They couldn't leave their homes without a male guardian. They were required to wear burqas in public. Today, the Taliban claims they will respect women's rights within the confines of their interpretation of Islam. Kind of an important caveat. They have also promised to uphold press freedom and adapt to a new and more modern country. But three months after they took power, these promises seem to be all talk. This protest Saturday, violently suppressed by Taliban fighters. Rifle butts and tear gas used against women asking only to work, go to school, and to be included in Afghanistan's new government. Taliban spokespeople claim that skirmishes like these have been caused by fighters not yet trained in their new, more enlightened Taliban governing style. But even if that's true, and it's doubtful, the group's top brass has yet to develop a plan for women's full return to the classroom or for inclusion in a new government. They've even dismantled the Afghan Ministry of Women and replaced it with the Ministry of Virtue, which sounds kind of Orwellian to me. Burqas have been swapped for niqabs and abayas, which still cover everything but a woman's eyes. Press freedom also doesn't seem high on the Taliban's to-do list. Afghan journalists have been brutally beaten by authorities. One even partially lost vision and hearing from the abuse. Of the more than 700 female journalists that were working in Kabul before August, fewer than 100 remain active today, according to Reporters Without Borders. And executions and amputations as capital punishment are likely to return soon, according to one Taliban spokesman. To further worsen matters, the country is on the brink of famine as Afghanistan heads into a brutally cold winter. The Taliban says it is ill-equipped to respond to this crisis without adequate funds. And they've pleaded for the World Bank, the IMF, the Biden administration to unfreeze more than $9.5 billion in foreign reserves and loans. That request is likely going to be ignored, even though 43% of the country's GDP under former President Ashraf Ghani came from foreign aid, according to the World Bank. Even after a media blitz on Western TV outlets, the international community hasn't been quick to welcome the Taliban to the table after their takeover. China, Pakistan, and Russia have yet to recognize the new government, despite early reports that suggested that they might. How can the international community help Afghan civilians avoid a dire humanitarian crisis without further legitimizing a group that the United States and allies fought against for more than 20 years? 
I speak today to one of the world's top experts on Central Asia, journalist and author Ahmed Rashid. And here's our conversation. Ahmed Rashid, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Of course, uh, the headlines have moved far away from Afghanistan, and that's not to the advantage uh, of the people living there. Um, tell, tell me so far, to the extent that we can make any judgment, how you think the political situation on the ground in Afghanistan is playing out now that the Americans are well gone. Well, I think that there are enormous issues. Um, the, the drought, uh, the COVID, the virus, possible starvation, which the World Food Program is alerting people already that it, people could be starving in a matter of days or weeks. Um, and the, very, the, the enormous reluctance of the Taliban to take on board uh, what Western governments and the UN and other NGOs are suggesting, um, that they ease up on... Uh, uh, on, on women, on education, um, and uh, they show some uh, compatibility with, uh, with Western demands. The problem is that the Taliban ruled, but they did not govern. By the time um, the Americans went to war with uh, the Taliban and Osama, and Osama bin Laden, the Taliban were already hugely discredited and, and generally rendered hopeless by the Afghan population who had fled. And we seem to be repeating that whole scenario once again. And I think it's incredibly important now that um, the West should differentiate between recognition, which should not be on the cards for the time being, um, and actually supporting uh, the food crisis and preventing uh, millions of Afghans from starving to death. Now, is there a mechanism? I mean, we know that the Americans have frozen billions of dollars of Taliban assets. Is there a mechanism that is credible that would allow for humanitarian aid at the scale that we're talking about is necessary that would not go through the Taliban government, that would not be siphoned away or stolen uh, by officials that we can't trust? I don't see that that $9 billion that is lying in U.S. accounts is unlikely to be freed. And I'm sure they're, they're very complicated um, uh, uh, methodology which will be needed to free it. Instead, what you're looking at potentially is fresh money um, from uh, donors uh, who, who could pr provide it to the UN to buy food. Um, now, of course, there, there are all sorts of other things involved. We need, uh, me desperately need medical aid, uh, need, uh, um, uh, Westerners need to be able to um, come and go freely from Afghanistan who to in order to run this aid program. Um, there's been no hint of any of this so far, and we don't seem to have an American strategy or a policy uh, towards how the Americans are going to react towards this uh, humanitarian crisis. You know, you wrote the book on the Taliban uh, back in 2000, uh, known worldwide. Um, if you were writing that book again today, uh, ha have they changed? Well, you know, unfortunately, again, we, we fall back on this issue of governance. We thought uh, for a long time that the Taliban would be educating and training uh, the, their younger generation to become bureaucrats and um, uh, handlers of civil society, but we were wrong. There are a lot of cosmetic changes, such as they use iPhones, they can take pictures, which of course was Photography was banned uh, in the earlier Taliban government. We don't have a Taliban policy as to what they want to do regarding all these very sensitive issues which people are walking around, tiptoeing around, um, and, and not wanting to face up to uh, a, a Taliban decree which will ban uh, this newspaper or that television station. The other thing, of course, is the factionalism within the Taliban. And for the time being, it seems... Uh, although it's very difficult to decipher exactly what's happening, but it certainly seems that the hardliners um, in the Taliban who don't want to make changes in their style of government or in their ideology, they are winning out at the moment. Uh, and, and leading the pack there are the Haqqanis. There are two Haqqanis in the cabinet, two more uh, uh, minor, minor officials in the cabinet, um, and they uh, are... I presume, thinking of their own future, they've got uh, a $10 million reward uh, for their capture or death 
uh, from the Americans. They are very confident because they seem to have uh, uh, wrapped any kind of voices of moderation from the Taliban on the knuckles. And they seem to be now uh, basically running the show. And uh, so it's, it's very difficult um, uh, for Western governments also to deal with the uh, issues of factionalism and division and who's on top now, who's not on top now, um, uh, and the uh, failure really to cultivate in all the months of negotiation in Qatar, uh, the failure to cultivate a more moderate uh, uh, Taliban. Can we at the very least say that the Taliban for now are still in charge of the whole country? Or do you start to see real chaos um, in terms of different, like in the north, for example, where it would be very hard for them to be able to impose authority, where you're starting to see just lawlessness emerge again? Well, I think, again, it all depends on whether humanitarian relief is going to uh, reach uh, the Afghan civilian population. If it just reaches the elite in the cities and just reaches the Taliban military machine and ignores the, 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 the public, uh, uh, there will be two, two results. One, there'll be a massive um, uh, walkout of the public uh, as refugees in neighboring Iran, Pakistan, even Central Asia. And that would probably be stopped because the, both Iran and Pakistan right now uh, are bankrupt, basically. Uh, they, are, they have said very categorically that we cannot accept any large numbers of refugees. And that's, you know, very much, we've seen the situation in Europe, how it's getting back to us. Many Afghans having reached uh, Eastern Europe, uh, going through Iran and Turkey. Um, and uh, nobody's in the mood to have another influx of uh, refugees coming in from Afghanistan, uh, no matter how bad the, the pictures of suffering we see on the TV. Remember that uh, the, the refugee crisis is acute because Iran and Pakistan are still holding refugees from the Soviet period. Uh, and uh, not counting those refugees who fled the first Taliban government 20 years ago and subsequent fighting. Women are in an absolutely uh, parlous state that are willing to, you know, uh, effectively throw their lives at, at, at in, in danger um, to, uh, to get their message out. And we're hearing it. But at the other hand, the Taliban government allowing it to persist, I mean, in ways that certainly wouldn't have happened uh, when you wrote your book. And I'm wondering um, why you think that is. Well, I, certainly the Taliban I, I have not uh, resumed beating women savagely in the streets the way they did uh, back in 2000 when they took Kabul. Um, and any, any hint of any kind of protest would uh, lead to a, always an automatic uh, harsh treatment of women and, and anyone else who was protesting. Uh, you know, that may not be happening, but what I'm trying to say is that as hunger increases, unrest increases, um, and uh, uh, more people, not just women, but men and families and come out on, onto the streets demanding wheat. Um, if you've seen some of the wheat that has come in from Iran and Pakistan being distributed, it's uh, horrific scenes of people just throwing themselves at the truck, you know, trying to get a bag of wheat out. Um, and things like that are going to multiply. Um, and, you know, I, I do think it's very important that the Americans develop some kind of strategy as to how to deal with this situation. And Ella, but before we close, talk to me just a little bit about what you think ISIS and other uh, terrorist organizations' capabilities and intentions are as it stands right now in Afghanistan. There are multiple terrorist groups active in Afghanistan. And, and the truth of the matter is that they have been fighting with the Taliban against the enemies and against the Americans. Um, and these groups who in, from Central Asia, Pakistan, um, uh, 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 have been extremely active and helpful um, to the Taliban. Many of them are living along the border with Pakistan. Now, for me, the real issue is it's very easy for for the world to say, well, the, the, the Taliban have to stop all these terrorist groups. Well, the first issue is, do they want to stop these terrorist groups? Because these terrorist groups are their allies. They've been their allies in the fight uh, against the Americans. And if they suddenly tell these groups to stop it, go home, um, go retire, whatever, 
uh, there's a big chance that these groups will turn against the Taliban, just like ISIS has turned against uh, the Taliban. So um, uh, that's the first, uh, I think, really uh, Im important issue. And secondly, what do the Taliban do with these people, even if they would be willing to wrap them up? What do they do? Do they kill them? Do they put them in jail? Um, how, do they punish them? Uh, do they send them back to their own home country? Well, Ahmed Mashid, uh, we didn't resolve it. Uh, not that I thought we were going to, but I really appreciate you joining us today. And uh, I know that uh, you've made us all a little bit smarter on what's happening on the ground. Thank you. The last time I spoke to education activist Pashtana Durrani was in August. She was on the move in Afghanistan in hiding from the Taliban as the United States withdrew its last forces from Kabul. I didn't do anything to the United States, right? It was the Taliban who bombed them, right? So then why don't you ask them to pay for the consequences? Why do I have to pay with my rights for those consequences? Today, Pashtana has found a new home in the United States. She's a visiting fellow at Wellesley College, where she continues her fight for girls' education in the country that she fled. I recently caught up with her in Washington, D.C. Pashtana Durrani, good to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. When I spoke to you, you were in hiding, and it was stressful as heck even to talk to you. I couldn't imagine what it would be like for you in that environment. How, how'd you get out? I had my university help me. I had the same time a friend of mine who actually works with the military. She was following up with my work and everything. And she was the one who got me out. And then she got me to Pakistan. I got my visa in Pakistan. And then I'm here as a student on a, a J1 as a researcher. So yeah, it was pretty much legally. I went and boarded a plane for Pakistan Islamabad through an NGO. And then they helped me get to Pakistan. And then through Pakistan, I got to US. I'm still working on everything that I was working when we last talked. Now, I mean, they're, they're claiming, of course, the Taliban government that they're going to allow women to go to school, that this is a reformed government. And do you see any evidence uh, that, uh, that they are, are actually trying to in any way reform? I'll believe them when they open schools for girls. I will believe them when they open uh, working spaces for girls. I'll believe them when they actually cut do the walk the talk instead of them like you know claiming the whatever they do for me it's more important every time they claim that that's not happening and we are reformed show me the reforms so that i can believe you i don't believe talks i believe actions now are you saying that there that no no women are attending schools in afghanistan right now so from grade one to grade six the schools are open but at the same time there is a huge uh, problem of salaries that the teachers are facing right now uh, at the same time uh, from class six till class 12 this uh, uh, class seven to class 12 the uh, schools are still closed teachers are not teaching girls are not attending so that's a huge part of uh, afghanistan that's sitting at home that's 50 percent of the workforce but also at the same time 50 percent of the academic force that's at home. Now, you know, Pashtana, I mean, on the one hand, I'm really delighted to see you safe here in the United States. And on the other hand, I'm sorry, because it wasn't your choice uh, to le leave your country. Um, it was forced upon you. Do you think that this will be a place that you can call home? I'm definitely going to uh, use this opportunity as uh, a person who would grow, who would learn more. Uh, of course, uh, embrace this place as a second home. That's like, you know, that's something uh, we as humans do. We migrate and we um, uh, get uh, like, you know, everything we could learn from the second home. But at the same time, I do hope to go back to my home and make sure whatever I have learned here and make sure that I bring the best of uh, that learning to back to Afghanistan because that, those are the people who need it the most. Pashana Jarani, thanks so much for joining. Thank you for having me. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see or think that, hey, Afghanistan is just the kind of place I'd like to spend some time, why don't you take a minute to sign up for G-Zero's most excellent morning newsletter? It's called Signal.